some of the places in the United States that will be most affected tend to have, ironically, very high property values, and that is in the Northeast. So the Northeast is going to see a lot of increased flooding. Boston, Massachusetts wins the contest for the number of coastal flooding events. Lots of people living on the coast there, and again, very high property values. Bar Harbor, Maine, it's a, a sort of like you would call it a resort vacation area, and it's very high population with very wealthy homes is also way up there with flooding. Hello everyone and welcome to another Climate Emergency Forum. My name is Regina and I'll be your host today as we explore coastal flooding and how it may affect us in the coming years and of course, decades. Uh, it's a very important topic and one that we're all going to be exposed to one way or another. There's absolutely no way to escape this. Now, I'm gonna be focusing primarily on the United States, but one thing that I want to point out is um, that there are some countries that are going to be much more exposed to coastal flooding than the United States, and they're much less prepared. Why is that? Well, they don't have the infrastructure that the United States, Canada, Europe has, Australia. They also don't have the funds to continually repair and rebuild that other wealthier nations do. They also, people who are living on the coasts of other countries tend to have shelter that is less protected. That is, you're not going to see the McMansions on, in Kolkata that you'll be seeing on the eastern shore of Long Island. And so it's very, very difficult. If we look at a place like Bangladesh, for example, Dhaka being on a floodplain, it's constantly being flooded and people People are getting, people have been and will continue to be washed out to sea. This is not something that you see in the wealthier nations. But I do want to point out some of the urban areas that are greatest threat of coastal flooding. I've already mentioned India and Kolkata is the number one place in the world today that has the greatest amount of exposed population. So we're looking at 2 million people, and in terms of flooding, they are like right up there, number one dangers from flooding. And also Mumbai is uh, ranked number two, and I've already brought up Dhaka, that's rated as number three in terms of severity of flooding. When we look at places like Shanghai and Bangkok with their tremendous population, we really get a sense of how urgent this climate coastal flooding is. Now, zooming back to the United States, we've seen some flooding even this past weekend. San Diego had tremendous flooding and you just saw just cars just riding down these rivers of streets, just being driven down the water as if they're like tiny little rafts. That's how powerful these natural events are. Some of the places in the United States that will be most affected tend to have, ironically, very high property values, and that is in the Northeast. So the Northeast is going to see a lot of increased flooding, and in fact, has been seeing increased flooding. This information on a chart that compares coastal flooding from 1950 to 69, and then from 70 to 89, 90 to 2009, and then 2010 to 2022, the coastal flooding events, the average number of flood events per year and this last decade has just skyrocketed. And I'm looking at places like Galveston, Texas, which is a barrier island. So they're not supposed to have a major city built on barrier islands, but hey, it's happened in Galveston. And so as the population in these cities, such as Galveston, increase, so have the flood events. 
Now, going back to the Northeast, we're seeing places like the Battery in New York City. That's right in the downtown, just right at the tip of New York City. It's being, the Battery is an apropos name because it's continually being battered by the Atlantic there. A Boston, Massachusetts has had, it wins the contest for the number of coastal flooding events. Lots of people living on the coast there. And again, very high property values. Bar Harbor, Maine, it's a, a sort of like you would call it a resort vacation area. And it's very high population with very wealthy homes is also way up there with flooding. So different impacts, but still many, many flooding dangers. And I want to turn it over to Paul to talk more about the science of what's causing this increase in coastal flooding and what we can expect. Thank you, Regina. So sea level rise uh, is accelerating. There is uncertainty in uh, lurches that occur in it, like and when they'll occur, because, you know, certainly if, if large um, glaciers calve quickly from places like Greenland and especially West Antarctica, then you can get surges of sea level, you know, very rapid sea level rise over short periods of time. You know, we've seen this in the paleo records, uh, looking back in the past, especially after the end of the last ice age, which peaked 21,000 years ago, there were these so-called meltwater pulses, which came from time to time as the ice was receding, as ice dams collapsed and things like that. So. You know, as we continue to warm the Arctic and Antarctic at accelerating rates, we're seeing more and more calving of glaciers. The glaciers that are the biggest wild card are actually marine glaciers, if you like. They're, the, they're, they're not glaciers on land, but they're glaciers that are sitting on bedrock um, because there's a huge mass of ice above, like especially in West Antarctic. So these glaciers are, are melting. They're being undercut from below by warming seawater that infiltrates down. And uh, a lot of them are on retrograde slope. So as they melt back more and more, the rate of melting accelerate. There's one in particular, you know, in West Antarctic, where as the front of the glacier moves more and more inland, the glaciers actually um, a thousand meters above sea level. The problem is, is as you undercut ice, you can't have a thousand meter cliff of ice. There's a calving front instability of ice. Um, ice is only strong enough to withstand a cliff of about a hundred meters, typically is what you see on floating ice shelves. You know, a hundred meters is the highest, maybe 120, 130 meters. But above that, the ice is just not strong enough to hold the, um, to hold the cliff. So you get calving and collapse and whole glaciers can disintegrate very quickly. I mean, we've seen that with Larson A, Larson B, Larson C. So what I'm saying is as climate continues to warm at ever faster rates, we have the expansion of the seawater occurring. We have uh, more and more ice being entered into the oceans from ice that is melting on land, from the, uh, the huge ice sheets, also from mountain glaciers and things like that. So we're getting a lot of sea level rise acceleration ongoing. And when you combine that with high tides, like king tides, um, also, you know, the moon and earth, uh, earth locations, you know, that are generating the tides, if they're aligned in certain directions, um, you can get extremely high tides. And then we're getting storm surges as well. And that we're also getting changes in the ocean current. So the slowing down of the Gulf Stream, more water means more water is being pushed up on the East Coast. So yes, uh, you, you've mentioned uh, lots of flooding in Maine recently, um, New Hampshire along the East Coast, Eastern Seaboard of the U.S., loads of flooding. There was a, a U.S. base, I believe, in the Marshall Islands on an atoll that was just swept, you know, huge damage to it from very, very high uh, wave action. Also, on you mentioned on the West Coast, uh, you mentioned San Diego, which is ongoing. And uh, a month or two ago, there was very, very high water, you know, around the the Los Angeles area. So, so coastlines there experienced extremely high wave action and damage to places on on the coast. So, and and not to mention the low lying areas, as you've mentioned, like Bangladesh. That country, you know, is very, very close to sea level and 
There's also major Chinese cities that are, will be in trouble. And of course, you know, Florida, and, and when you get a tropical storm, you know, a hurricane on top of the higher sea level, then it makes um, it really difficult to justify living on low-lying coastlines. It's just, it's just going to get worse as, as warming continues. Thank you so much, Paul. Exactly. Uh, the, the whole notion of people living near the coast because they want to live near the coast. I think it's a very different situation when you're talking about East Hampton, New York, Bar Harbor, Maine versus DACA. Um, those people absolutely are pushed to the region due to poverty and a lack of opportunity through no fault of their own. They're living in a danger zone. Um, it's the people who are choosing to live and these wealthy enclaves that it's it's really a fool's errand. And if you want to know the truth, it shouldn't be allowed. I mean, it's jacking up the insurance costs for many people who are having to subsidize those who want to live, you know, in East Hampton, South Hampton, Bar Harbor, Maine. So it's a totally different situation. And absolutely, thank you so much for mentioning the cities in China that are on the coast, also very heavily populated. So uh, it's going to be really interesting to see how these various municipalities handle the dangers that are staring down at them. And I want to take it to Peter and hear what you have to say, Peter. The first thing that sort of I noticed and think about on uh, sea level rise, it's the um, going back years. It's the big thing that the scientists have always focused on. That's, of course, totally reasonable. But on the other hand, the scientists have also told us way back that we wouldn't have anything in a way of very uh, damaging or serious sea level rise for many, many hundreds of years. Well, of course, what's happened is that uh, the more research that we get, same with other things, the more and earlier the sea level rise is becoming. And that's very obviously going to continue. As Paul mentioned, there are the two aspects of um, thermal expansion of the ocean and the addition of a fresh water into the ocean from the melting of the ice sheets. Now, maybe about eight years ago or so, I think, the um, ice sheet melting was contributing more to the sea level rise than the thermal expansion. So that's definitely going to continue in that way. From my point of view, I think that um, sea level rise is an excellent uh, climate change indicator. I think it's actually a better climate change indicator than global warming because you have the direct effect of uh, warming, which is the direct effect on the ocean, which is where all the heat goes anyway. And um, that's giving you your thermal expansion. So you've got that direct effect, but you've also got the actual impact of surface warming contributing to sea level rise from the ice sheets. So the fact that sea level rise is accelerating and it is dramatically accelerating. I mean, you just can't miss it. Probably we should have paid a lot more attention to that and uh, not be um, uh, debating whether global warming is accelerating um, because we know that sea level rises. So I think that's a very, very important indicator. The um, NOAA, you know, they have a map as well. It's a good map. Um, they've changed it quite a lot in the past year or two. The last thing I want to say then is, is perhaps the most important thing about sea level rise is that um, it's not the same everywhere. It differs very much around the oceans. And so there are, there are hot spots. And as uh, Regina's already mentioned, the northeast coast of the United States is very, very much a hot spot. If you look at sea level rise projected um, at uh, two degrees C, it's way more than anywhere else around the world. It's quite surprising. So, um, yeah, NOAA and the scientists are focusing on that. So that's very good. And, you know, they've quoted huge amounts of dollars, which are going to have to be spent. Um, uh, that's happening in Miami already. The other places where they have a lot more sea level rise than other parts of the world ocean, East China Sea is one. That's the coast of China and, and Japan. Another one is the Eastern Pacific. So that may include some of those small islands. So we're going to be at two degrees C. We, we better get used to that. Our uh, governments have us headed to over three degrees C. Um, but I think that we should stop talking about 1.5 degrees C 
you know, this nonsense that um, the scientists and everybody is still putting out. I mean, for heaven's sake, we're at 1.4 degrees C now. How can you possibly say that we're going to um, avoid 1.5 degrees C? And we need to be accurate on the science because we need the policy to drive the realistic truth of where we're at. And that is terrifying. Maybe that's why the scientists don't want to acknowledge it. But um, uh, but we have to prepare for two degrees C. And that means a very significant, very expensive sea level rise contribution, especially to the northeast of the United States. Oh, and, and also the um, Gulf and the um, and the southern uh, part of the states there. They're also a relatively a hot spot. It's going to take a lot of money to deal with this. I think that's the important thing. Yeah, thank you so much for bringing out the financial aspect of this. Um, of course, people want to focus on how it will affect humanity, firstly, and then the other living beings that will be harmed. But the financial aspect is very, very real. You mentioned Miami. I can't even say how many billions. So I've got numbers for what various municipalities can expect their expenditure or their losses to be by the year 2070. I can't even figure out these numbers. They're so huge. But for Miami, we're looking at hundreds of billions of dollars, many, many, many hundreds of billions. The same thing for Guangzhou in China. And third on the list with the highest number of assets and the number of the greatest amount of costs is, in fact, New York City. So, yes, the East Coast is very, very vulnerable. And, of course, we have sea level rise. And I understand that it's in many, many ways, most ways, a separate issue. But you also have subsidence or subsidence. That is the land sinking. Now, it turns out that New York is apparently sinking at a very, very low rate due to the extraordinary amount of buildings on the island. This has recently been found out. And of course, it's also sinking because of the glacial isostatic adjustment. And then we have the sea level rise. So you have all of these compounding factors. But one thing that I thought was really interesting is we have the East Coast of the United States facing many hundreds of billions, billion, billions, of losses and damages, but right up there with these wealthy American cities is Kolkata in India. Yes, they're a rising economy, we understand that, but in terms of sheer amount of money available for uh, reconstructing, I don't expect that they would have the resources available to them the way that wealthier nations will. So it's a great loss uh, for everyone. And I, I also, appreciate your bringing up the Gulf Coast because New Orleans is also way up there in terms of losses due to coastal flooding. And of course, we know that there's the Mississippi River and the fact that New Orleans is a major, major port city, very important to the United States. So there's nothing holding back the ocean, folks. And uh, we're just going to see more and more sea level rise and threats to our coasts. Am I right there, Paul? Yes, I just want to expand a little bit on what Peter said about uh, sea level rise. It's not it's not uniform around the planet. There's lots of different effects. You know, we've mentioned the very very high sea level rise in the U.S. Northeast, and part of the contribution to that is the slowing of the the ocean current, so the Gulf Stream, so the water is getting piled up on the uh, coastline of Maine. So sea level rise for the last number of years has been something like four times higher than the global average sea level rise. It's something like 12 millimeters per year in the regions. Also, the water being piled up is very, very warm. Um, so it, there's a lot of expansion of that water. You know, scuba divers going down 50, 100 feet off the coast of Maine are finding the water temperature just unprecedented for them. I want to mention um, also that as the glacier glaciers melt, say, in Greenland, not only is the water, fresh water, entering the ocean, raising global sea levels, but also the, the mass loss of the ice on Greenland means that less water is being pulled towards Greenland. 
right? You can think of just the gravitational attraction of a, a vast glacier, you know, pulls water actually towards it. So as that ice melts, the attraction becomes less. So the water leaves that region and travels to the global oceans further south, you know, contributing to the sea level rise there. Also, ironically, you can actually have sea level dropping in off those glaciers off Greenland, you know, local drop because of the water shifting away. If that overwhelms the overall rise from expansion and these other factors. Also, the coastlines in the Arctic are very important, clearly. And uh, with the lack of Arctic sea ice, the wave action is much higher and you can get a lot of coastal erosion and people, small communities on coastlines in the Arctic are having to, in some cases, evacuate and move to, you know, resettle on higher ground because of the coastal erosion. Also, there's lots of permafrost in the soils and in the, in the earth. And uh, if that's exposed by er coastal erosion, then that can erode that much more quickly. I just want to mention uh, one more big concern I have about accelerating sea level rise, and that's the uh, loss of the Antarctic sea ice. We're way, way down, almost 2 million square kilometers at times. And it's not the actual loss of the sea ice itself that raises sea level because it's floating ice. But that sea level actually acts as a kind of buttress along the coastlines of Antarctica to keep the wave action down and to keep the glacier feeds, uh, the calving down and so on of the ice shelves. So the problem is, is when all that Antarctic sea ice is missing, then the waters around Antarctica can, can warm up that much faster and uh, can greatly accelerate melt rates of that Antarctic sea ice. So the last couple of years, we've seen record low amounts of Antarctic sea ice. If this continues, then I think we're going to see a notching up of melt from Antarctica and, and a um, corresponding notching up of sea level rise, you know, very quickly within the next few years. So all of these different factors, all of these different details are exacerbating the problem. And I just want to remind people that over 90 percent, about 91 percent of Earth heating is ocean heating, right? the vast majority is only about five percent is heating the actual land and about three percent is heat is melting the ice heating the cryosphere only one percent of the energy heating on the planet is is heating the atmosphere the, that's what's causing the record global temperatures that we're seeing you know we live on the land in an atmosphere so <laughs> we're we tend to ignore the oceans, but 91% of the heat is heating the oceans. And of course, it's causing huge expansion and, and uh, continuing rapid sea level rise. Thank you so much for bringing up the ocean and how it's heating so quickly and so rapidly. I think people really don't realize, though so many, so much of humanity lives near the coast, I think it's hard to imagine what's going on in the ocean because, you know, we see it and it looks the same every day but we're not in it. We are not living in it. And so the changes that every other living organism is experiencing, it's easy to become blissfully unaware of. So thank you so much for bringing that up. And of course, the more it heats up, the more it expands. It's just a never ending causal loop. So yeah, Peter, I'm wondering if you have any follow-up thoughts from what uh, Paul just shared. Well, I, I would just like to reinforce what you said, Regina, because yeah, there are maps which show the huge and increasing populations that uh, are living on the coast and are living on, on the coast, vulnerable to sea level rise. And more and more people, faster and faster, are moving to the coastal cities. So um, that's really important. It's got to be factored in. So um, the rate of sea level rise now is, uh, as Paul was uh, explaining and talking about, is largely um, a Greenland ice sheet issue, right? It seems to be every time we have a new research paper on the Greenland ice sheet, it's, it's more and more vulnerable, and it's going to start slipping irreversibly down into the ocean um, sooner and sooner. And uh, that brings us, of course, to um, uh, global warming and the acceleration of global warming. So rather than denying and ignoring the acceleration of global warming, we really, really have to concentrate on it. And we have to assess all the other impacts, particularly the vulnerability of the Greenland ice sheet and sea level rise. We have to 
and now assess that on the background of a rapid acceleration of global warming. And as I say, saying that we are going to keep to 1.5 degrees C is not only absurd, it's terrible from the point of view of policy planning and for infrastructure planning. We've talked about how much it's going to cost to deal and adapt to the sea level rise. We need to be doing that on the basis of at least two degrees C because that's where we're going to be. And we've got to try and keep keeping ahead of the curve all the time, not staying behind the curve of global warming and climate change, which is what we've been doing. Thank you so much, Peter, for bringing up the importance of being ahead of the curve rather than behind the curve. I have to say that sadly, we are certainly behind the curve. And as you mentioned, behind the curve and still mentioning keep 1.5 alive. And come on. That's such a canard at this point. As you say, we have to move beyond that because the science has already said, and of course, we have to move beyond that because as Dr. James Hansen has already informed us, it's way, way, way in the rear view mirror. And of course, you, our viewers, know that. You're aware of that. You're educated. You're part of a great minority. And even as such, we want you to take your voices, your knowledge, your information, and to share it far and wide. Because even having a conversation with someone at the checkout, you could plant a seed of awareness, and that could go a long way. So if you've learned something from this show, and we hope you have, please go ahead and click that thumbs up. It helps with the algorithm. Share the video with a friend. And if you haven't subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? Subscribe. We want to welcome you into the fold. So thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you with the next Climate Emergency Forum. Thank you.